If you're ready, say, I'm ready. ready. Let's do it. We're starting a brand new series this week called Life in the Light. Uh, It's a series that we're hoping will take us more on the journey further down the road of understanding how Scripture can change the way we live. Uh, We will be spending the next eight weeks, from now till the end of May, focusing on a letter that Paul wrote to a church in a place called Ephesus. We call that letter Ephesians. And it's in your Bible, in the New Testament. And uh, we're going to be mining through that letter, looking through it on a weekly basis, and just trying to understand why it should matter to us at all. Um, the truth is, is the guy who wrote it is, a, is, a, is, if anyone would have placed a bet on whether or not this guy would have been a guy writing about Jesus in a positive way, they would have lost money because everyone would have said, not, not him, like not this guy. Paul, whose name was Saul prior, his Jewish name, he went by Saul, uh, was a Pharisee. He was uh, someone who was highly educated in Jewish scripture, and he is someone who was confident that Jesus was a fraud. I mean, like, confident that Jesus was a fraud. And so he had people arrested for following Jesus, and, and he was chasing people down. He was there when people were persecuted for their faith. Jesus wasn't real until he met him. See, when Paul met Jesus and had an encounter with Jesus, everything changed. That's my story too. Is it yours? It's all not real until you meet Jesus. Prior to that, it's just some kind of religious thing. And then all of a sudden, you meet Jesus and you go, oh, I missed it. Paul missed it. Then Paul journeyed through uh, Asia Minor and into Europe sharing about this Jesus that he now knew without a shadow of a doubt was real. And the same passion he had for arresting Christians, he now had that same passion to help people find Jesus. And that is awesome. And in the process of that, He begins to write letters to places he's visited or places he's heard about through other people. And he's sharing with them over and over again about what it means to follow Jesus. And uh, those letters make up half of our New Testament. So we're going to look at one of those letters. I try to do this at least once a year with you because I think Paul's letters are that important. If you were with us last year around the same time, we uh, covered Colossians and Philemon. And we talked about those two letters and what they have to do in our lives. The year before that, we went through Philippians and did this very same thing because it is important that we look at Paul's letters because I think Paul's letters matter to us. Why? Because every letter from Paul to the churches is a direct communication urging them to become everyday disciples. Every letter that Paul writes is a direct communication to churches teaching them how to become everyday disciples, okay? Now, the truth is, is the entirety of Scripture teaches us how to become everyday disciples, doesn't it? But it does it through a lot of ways, through storytelling, through parables, uh, through apocalyptic literature like Revelation. I mean, there's all these places that we can pick up pieces of information that teach us how to be everyday disciples. What I love about Paul's letters is they just tells us. Like, it's a direct communication. This is what it means to follow Jesus. And this is how he can change you. This letter specifically, the letter uh, to the Ephesians, is part of a group of letters known as the prison epistles of Paul. Uh, The word epistle is just a fancy word for letter, right? Paul was in prison in Rome and he was writing letters to churches. Uh, While he was in prison, he wrote the letter to the Philippians, a letter in a place we call Philippi. He wrote a letter to a church in Colossae, a letter we call Colossians. He wrote this letter to the Ephesians, and he wrote a letter to an individual named Philemon. All of these letters were written in prison in the same period of time. And that makes this letter a little unique. But if we're going to jump in, and y'all probably know me by now, if we're going to jump into a letter about Ephesians, we better know a little bit about Ephesus right? We better understand where the place is before we read into the letter. So let me tell you a little bit about Ephesus. Ephesus is on the west coast of Turkey, modern day Turkey. And uh, Ephesus itself, uh, back in the day in the first century, 
was huge. Okay? It was a port city. Boats went right up to Ephesus. They could get off. They could trade goods, jump back on another boat and take off. And because of that, there were all different kinds of people who lived in Ephesus. People from further away in Asia or places we would now call like Japan or China. There were people living in Ephesus who were Jewish, who had come up north from Israel. There were people who, there were Greeks and there were Italians. And, and there were, I mean, there were people from all over the place because this was a place where everyone ended up. It was a port town. Okay? And the town was huge. How huge? Well, the best guess is about around the time that Paul would have spent three years there uh, with the people. It was about 300,000 people who lived in Ephesus. It's pretty big. I mean, even, even for our times now, it's big. But back then, when there were less population over the world, I mean, this was a big town. Rome had about a million people. Uh, Ephesus was only about fifth or sixth after that. This is a big place. So I've always wondered, how do they actually know the population of a place that's in ruins from 2,000 years ago? Like, how does that actually work? Well, a lot of scholars say that the best way to tell the population of a city of that time is to look at its theater, the place where they would hold town meetings, the place where they would see uh, or all the people or like a representative of each family would show up when they had important decisions to make. So while I was in Ephesus two weeks ago, I took time to stop and turn around and take a picture of the theater of Ephesus. And this is what it looks like. Hopefully you can see that. But that big thing in the background that's kind of sweeping out like that, that is the theater of Ephesus. And uh, the theater of Ephesus outside of Rome itself is the largest theater in the Roman Empire. Okay? Okay. The theater of Ephesus, that theater holds about 25, 26,000 people. So if there's any soccer fans in the room, uh, if you've been to a Columbus Crew game or to an FC Cincinnati game, it's about that size. 20 to 26,000 people. Okay? So when they saw that, uh, scholars believe that when you look at the size of a theater, uh, the size of the population of the city is about 10 to 15 percent of its theater. So 10, 10 to, well, the theater is 10 to 15 percent of its population. So we're looking at about 300,000 people all living in this place called Ephesus. Ephesus is more than just a big town, though. It's a town that's staunchly committed to what's called Roman paganism. And what Roman paganism is, is the belief that there are multiple gods, right? Like uh, you've heard of them like Zeus and Hera and Poseidon, right? This belief that there are multiple gods and these gods interact with people on a daily basis. So the way it works is uh, the people try to keep all the gods happy. So if it's, uh, I don't know, like going to be cloudy on the day of an eclipse, they would uh, pray to the god of clouds. And hope that he would remove those clouds so that all the people coming to Sydney, Ohio could actually see the sun tomorrow and not just see clouds, right? Uh, but there are things like that. Like they would do their best to try to manipulate the gods into giving them what they want through sacrifice. And the gods would respond in their mind. If your sacrifice was good enough, they would fix it for you. And the gods needed the sacrifice of the people to eat and the people needed the gods to make them happy. So they were like intertwined with each other. So everything was about making sure the gods are happy. And here's this man, Paul. Not very wealthy. Not very well spoken. Walking through the streets of Ephesus. I mean, just as a reminder, Paul himself says he was not well spoken when he speaks to people. He's walking through the streets and he's surrounded by a marketplace where people are selling statues to all the gods. Then he looks up and he sees what's considered one of the eight wonders of the world in the first century that exists right in the middle of Ephesus, the temple to Artemis. And back in the day, this is a good rendering of what that looked like. So this is the temple to Artemis, and no matter where you were in the city, it was on a high point, and you could see this temple. There's no point in me showing you what that looks like now because it's literally just one pillar in the ground. But back in the day, this is what it looked like. This is uh, 10 times larger than the Parthenon in, in Greece. 
This is a giant structure. And the people were in awe of the structure, but they were more in awe of the goddess Artemis. And so Paul's walking through a city with the shadow of this giant building over his head. Walking around people, everyone talking about the gods. And here he is with a message that there was a man named Jesus who died for you. And he wasn't man. He was fully man and fully God. And he loves you. A small flicker of light in an entire city of darkness. And so when he writes the letter to Ephesus, the letter we call Ephesians, all of this is running through his head. So before we jump in, the way the, way the book of Ephesians is structured, chapters one through three of Ephesians are about what God has done for us. Simply put, the gospel. Chapters four through six are about what our response should be as God's people. Okay? So today we're going to look at chapter one. We're going to jump right in. So if you're ready, say, I'm ready. Okay. You ready to get in scripture? Here we go. Ephesians chapter one, verse one says this. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. See, to the people of the Roman paganism world, the blessings all happen on earth. It's all about what can I get right now? What can I get right now from the gods? What can they give me? And what Paul is saying is, when you follow Jesus, you understand that it's not about what you can get right now. It's about the blessing that comes now and after our death. It's more than just about now. But the point I think Paul is trying to make here, and the point I want to make sure we hear as we jump in, is that every spiritual blessing in your life comes from Christ. See, in, a, in my world, like in my human world, this is kind of how I like to live. If I work at it and I do it on my own, I did it. If I get lucky and something happens that I didn't, that, that I didn't plan for, that I didn't work for, well, that must have been God blessing me. You been there, right? Like if, like if I do the work, it's not him, it's me. But if it just happens, well, that's clearly God blessing me. It's not true. It's a lie. Because even our ability to do work is a blessing, whether you think so or not. Our ability to do work is a blessing. So whether I work at it or it just happens, it's all from him. It's not me. It's him. Every blessing comes from Christ. Verse 4, for he chose us. Everybody say chose us. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption. Everybody say adoption. For adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. To the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. He chose us before he even said, let there be light. Are you with me? The Lord said, like we may have been created on day six of creation, but we were considered before day one. Before God said, let there be light, he chose us. He set apart humanity. I said, yeah, those are going to be my people. And not only that, I'm going to create a plan for their adoption. It's interesting because in the Roman world, adoption was something very interesting. It was uh, choosing to take someone, just like we do now, choosing to take someone into your family that biologically was not part of your family, right? But here's the deal. In the Roman culture, if I was 13, 12, and my parents died, whatever debt they had is now my debt. Whatever punishment they deserved, it's my punishment. Even though I'm a child, because I'm the oldest male, it all falls on me. But if you were adopted, every debt you had was forgiven. 
Because you were no longer part of that family. You were in a brand new family. Something had changed, not just uh, paperwork signed, but as the world looked at you, they saw you as a member of the family, not as just an adopted member of the family. In fact, it would be uh, completely crazy for someone in the first century to say, this is my son so-and-so, this is my daughter so-and-so, and this is my adopted son so-and-so. They would never use that language because once adoption occurs, you're in the family. Your debts are forgiven. You are seen as a full standing family member of the family. I think it's beautiful. I want to make sure you hear this morning that we were made to have a relationship with the creator of the universe. We weren't made just to be saved. We weren't made just to worship him. We were made and thought of from the beginning, before creation began, God said, they're going to be my family. We were made for relationship with him from the very beginning. It's not some kind of transactional thing. It is a beautiful, caring relationship that God has ordained from the beginning. Amen? Y'all don't fall asleep on me now. Verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood. It's that adoption, right? That our, our sins uh, cause death, but in him we have redemption. That his blood joins us into the family, right? His blood is the, re- the forgiveness of our sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. His blood is given for us to have our sins forgiven because God just loves us that much. He just loves us that much. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery. Everybody say mystery. He he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth. Paul loves to talk about the mystery of God, the mystery of his will. It shows up in other letters, not just this one. And here's the mystery. This is the thing that God shares with us that was previously unknown. I don't want a relationship with you until you die. I want a relationship with you that lasts forever. The mystery of The thing that's been hidden is that the plan all along was for God to send Jesus to this earth so that he could die for our sins and that because of that, we have access to God for eternity if we choose to put our hope in him. He made the mystery known to us. Verse 11, in him we are also chosen. Everybody say chosen. We are also chosen having been predestined according to the plan of him who works everything in conformity with the purpose of his will in order that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. Basically, we've been chosen and God is the one through Jesus that can actually put all these things in motion because he has the power to do it. He can make the entire earth under his conformity. He can make all the changes necessary for us to be with him forever. In verse 13, it goes on to say, and you were also included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. Okay, so here's the deal. We could talk for 10 weeks, 12 weeks, six months, on just the Holy Spirit. We could preach on it every single week, but in this moment, Paul is saying something very specific about the Holy Spirit. What he's saying is, is you have an earthly body and your earthly body is sinful and it's flesh and you struggle and I get it. But when you say yes and your sins are forgiven, when the blood of Jesus covers you, I'm depositing in you the Holy Spirit who is there to guide you and direct you. But here's the deal. That Holy Spirit is only a deposit of what is to come. 
See, there will come a day, folks, where our flesh will no longer hold us back. There will come a day where the struggles of this earth no longer keep us struggling with Jesus. There will come a day where we don't have to be concerned about test results. There will come a day where our relationship with our spouse, no matter how much of a struggle it is, it no longer is a distraction. There's a day coming where we have full access to God himself. Amen? In the meantime, the Holy Spirit, who lives inside of our, I mean, think about it. We are sinful people, and the Holy Spirit lives in us. It's kind of gross. Like this perfect, beautiful trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, exists inside of me, but I'm not worthy of that. But what it is, is it's a reminder of the relationship that is to come. Where we are no longer held by our flesh. So every time you feel the Holy Spirit speak to you, every time you sense the Spirit of God in you, understand that it's a whisper that says there's a day coming where you'll no longer be bound by any of this. And you'll have full access to the Father for for eternity, for eternity. Let's jump ahead to verse 18. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power. Everybody say power. His incomparably great power for us who believe. The power is the same. Do you see that? The power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. The Holy Spirit lives in us. The power in us is the same as the power that raised Jesus from the dead. Did I just give you permission to go raise people from the dead? Just so we're on the same page, I did not. Okay, I'm not saying that we can go raise people from the dead. What I'm saying is the fullness of the power of God through the Holy Spirit exists in us. Why? Because it's the generous gift of God. He just loves us. And he gives us access to that power. Final three verses. It says, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. He's talking about Jesus, and he's saying, like, hey, I know you all think these gods are important. I know you think that you're surrounded by this paganism. Everybody's worshiping everything. But here's the deal. Jesus, the name of Jesus, is far above all that. Anything in this earth that you think has status or power. Jesus is above that. Amen. Jesus is above all of those things. That there's nothing you could worship. There's nothing you could strive for. That he is not above both now and in the age to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. What's Jesus' body? Are you sure? What is it? The church is Jesus' body. Can I be honest with you? I don't like it. I know I have no control over it. I know Jesus obviously knows way more than I know, right? But man, like when I look at the church. We're, we're friends, right? <laughs> when I look at the church, y'all, we're an ugly body. We're an ugly body. Now, when I say the word church, I don't mean connection point, right? I don't even mean all the buildings across the globe that people are meeting for worship. 
I don't even mean everyone in this room who goes to church. Do you know that you can go to church, serve at church, give at church, and not be part of the church? See, here's the deal. When we talk about the church, we're not talking about what you do. We're talking about who you are, right? The church are the people of God who have said, I'm trying to become more like Jesus, who are journeying in a direction towards him. That's the church. Okay, so maybe some of us just got eliminated if that's the the, the definition of church. But for those that are left, we're still an ugly body. Okay, we're judgmental, we're arrogant, we're selfish. We think because we don't say things out loud, people don't care about our thoughts, even though Jesus sees every one of them. And I got to be honest with you, if I was a head and I was looking for a body and my head was perfect in every way, we are not the body I would be looking for. Tell me I'm wrong. It's ugly. And it left me with a question. And the question was, well, if we're the body, how are we doing? Like, if Jesus is the head and we're the body, how's it going? Well, let me tell you how it's going. Most surveys will tell you people who walk away from Jesus don't actually walk away from Jesus. They walk away from the body. That the body was so hurtful to them that it caused them to move away from Jesus. That's how we're doing as a body. That's how we're doing. Does that mean all of us are terrible? No, I'm not saying that. But let's be honest. Jesus attached himself to a messy, broken body. Is it because there were no other choices? Well, no, he's Jesus. He's got all the choices in the world. It's because from the beginning of time, he has wanted to have a relationship with us. And he says, even though you're broken and flawed, I am not, just keep looking more like me. Keep moving in the direction of me. Another way I would ask that question is, are the head and the body connected? That'd be weird, right? To have a head over here and a body over here? It's kind of strange. But I think throughout history, there are times where the head and the body are not as connected as they should have been. And what I can tell you is, at Connection Point and at many other local assemblies, we are working really hard to make sure that the people in this space are moving towards Jesus and connecting with him as opposed to being a disconnected body from the head. Are you with me? Okay. So that leaves us with just a question as we end chapter one. And the question is this, how do I live life in the light as an everyday disciple? Like if all these letters point us to becoming an everyday disciple and I'm saying yes to that and I'm trying to journey towards Jesus, how am I supposed to live? What am I supposed to get from this chapter that would actually help me live in the light of the Lord? Well, here's what I got. Everyday disciples, consider what God has done more than what we want him to do. You want to be an everyday disciple? You want to move into the direction of Jesus? This entire first chapter is about what he has done for us. And I got to tell you, spending time considering that is actually a very useful uh, way to live. Can I be honest with you? It's one of the things that I've learned, I think, in the last two years. If someone said to me, hey, Pastor Tim, what's one thing you've done in the last two years that has propelled your relationship with Jesus forward. It's not reading more scripture. What has propelled my relationship with Jesus forward over the last couple years has been creating space to just simply consider what God has done for me. I think silence is the most underutilized 
thing that we have on this earth. The ability to stop, to read maybe three verses instead of three chapters, to read three verses and then to create silence, to simply say, what does that mean for my life? Like, what am I actually supposed to do with that? Why should that matter to me? I love memorizing scripture. I love, re- you guys hopefully by now know how much I love the word of God. But if this congregation could learn the skill and the discipline of spending 30 minutes a day in complete silence while they think about what God has done for them, it would change us. It would completely change us. Why? Why should we think about what God has done for us? Because if what God did for you feels small, your devotion and commitment to him will also be small. If you think about what God has done for you and it's like, yeah, like, uh, like yeah, 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 like, uh, you know, God created the earth or whatever and, you know, he sent his son Jesus and then Jesus lived a perfect life and yeah, 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 like he, he died on the cross for my sins. That's awesome. And like, uh, yeah, then he like rose from the dead and he's coming back like, yeah, I get all that, but like, I need a new job. I need more money. I need my life to look different. If that's what your brain does, you have just shrunk what God has done in your life by minimizing it to get to what you want. And if your view of what God has done is small, your devotion is also small. Are you with me? Silence and considering what God has done will grow that muscle so that you can begin to see more and more who he is and why what he did for you is actually the greatest and biggest thing that will ever happen in the history of time. Ever. So, if we're going to grow that muscle, if we're going to move from small thinking about what God has done to large, then maybe we should go back into chapter 1 of Ephesians and just simply look and say, well, what do we learn about what God did for us in chapter 1? Here's the list, okay? Okay. We find out that we uh, have been blessed. He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing. All of it comes from Christ. He chose us. Everybody say chose us. He chose us before the creation of the world. We've been adopted. Everybody say adopted. We've been adopted into his family. He gave us Jesus, the greatest gift We've been redeemed by his blood. We've been set free from our sin because of the blood of Jesus. We have uh, been, he shared with us the mystery of his will. He didn't have to do that, but because of his relationship with us, he goes, let me tell you what the plan is. Let me tell you where this is headed. Here's the mystery of my will. The gift of the Holy Spirit that lives in us. What a gift. And access to the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. That, that's just chapter one, what God has done for us. If you would take 30 minutes a day in silence, just with that list alone, and just consider what God has done for you, you would find it's not so small. Because when we see what God did for us as gracious, undeserved, and something that changes more than just our earthly life but eternity, there is no other place worthy of our full devotion. Amen? Amen. Come on, y'all. There is no other place worthy of our full devotion. If we understand the gravity of what God has done for us, If we understand that it's not about what we want, it's about who he is. When we lean in to this gift that God has given us, all these gifts and blessings that come from above, all because he just wants to be in relationship with us. We begin to realize 
that there is no one, no thing worthy of our full devotion other than Jesus himself. I'm going to invite the worship team to head on back up. As many of you know, we do what we call car car conversations, which we try to create opportunities for people to have conversation on the way home. Uh, Parents with children or um, spouses or just whoever's in the car with you, you know, what are some things to consider as you drive home today? And today we just have a simple question. And the reason it's simple is because I want you to do it. Okay? I just want you to do it. So I made it real simple for you today. Here's the question. What is something God has done for you? That's it. Parents, can I be honest with you? The answers that come from children when you ask this question could be so life-giving. I remember asking this question or inversions of this question to my children as they were growing up and the things they would say back, like, you know, uh, what, what has God done for you? I remember Jackson at age three, when I, when just asking him, like, why do you love Jesus, you know? And, and he said to me, because he gave me soccer. And I'm like, yeah, he did, you know? And you get these answers from children that are just so innocent and beautiful where they realize that every blessing is from above. You know, we'd be like, well, actually, soccer was invented, you know? It's not that. He knows that every good thing in his life, everything that matters to him, is connected to the Father. Ask the question. Ask the question. What is something God has done for you? And here's my last question to you. I mean, if you know what God has done for you, if you have an answer to that question for yourself, if what you're saying is actually true, then what should your response be? If it's actually true, what should your response be? What do you do? If that's true, if he has done those things for you, do you just keep on living the way you're living? Do you just go to church on Sundays? You know what? God's done good things for me. I can at least give him Sunday morning. He's not asking for your Sunday morning. He's asking for you. So what do we do? Well, I don't know all the answers, but here's what I do know. He is worthy of every ounce of worship that we could give him whether we're in the car, whether we're at home, whether it's right now as we close service, he is worthy of every ounce of worship that I got.